people have these talking points, but nobody's taken any action. We keep going on the same path, waiting for the next shooting to happen. Rob, thank you for coming today, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So there, there's been a big push to examine school safety and and how to address this in Idaho. And obviously, just innumerable tragedies across the country, loss of life, incredible concern uh, from every parent dropping their kid off at school. You have multiple experiences with active shooters at schools and and really have, I mean, as boots on the ground as anybody could. What What's your perspective on school safety? What, what do people need to consider what has happened in, in your time in the, in the service. Talk to me about that. Well, um, I looked at some statistics not too long ago and since the mid to late nineties, there's been over a thousand injuries as a result of school shootings, over 500 kids and faculty have been killed. Um, and I noticed that after every incident happened, the politicians, they get up and they stand behind podiums and people start screaming for gun control or banning weapons or gun show loopholes or red flag laws or you know, issues with the, the gun shows, um, banning high capacity magazines, certain types of ammo. None of that means anything. People have these talking points, but nobody's taken any action. We keep going on the same path, waiting for the next shooting to happen. Um, Agencies do the best that they can. They have SROs at certain schools, but most of the schools don't have SROs. Um, and we're trying to come up with a different idea, something that's actionable that we can do to protect our kids and our faculty. It's not just about the kids. It's also about our teachers and our coaches and our librarians and everybody else too. But um, as the recent shooting that just happened in Iowa on January 4th of this year, the principal of the school attempted to negotiate with the shooter and he was shot and killed himself. Um, so we need to do something different. We have to. Now there, the, the bills that are being brought forward and at least one in particular with a uh, representative Hill, he is calling for some type of participation, voluntary participation of individuals that exist on school campus in a professional capacity aside from law enforcement. So we're talking about, you know, a janitor, we're talking about a, a coach, we're talking about some, uh, some teacher or administrator. And the the playbook is not unique to Representative Till, uh, Hill's uh, idea. Like this is something that has already been rolled out in other Idaho school districts where there are more rural school, school districts and they recognize, hey, if in the event that something should happen, you know, like we're not going to have a responder within four or five minutes. It could be much longer. So they've taken up volunteers and armed those volunteers, uh, trained obviously, and have an incredible system to to make sure there's safety involved. But that's one thing that they're doing to kind of respond to the lack of capacity for immediate response and need for security. Like, wh what do you think about that? I think it's, it's needed. Uh, Grangeville's doing it right now. They're trying to implement the program. They've bought firearms for teachers. Um, they're still trying to figure out how to roll it out. But uh, it, it's definitely needed. If you look at the school shootings across our country, if you look at things like Sandy Hook Elementary School, um, the kid that, that came to the school shot through two sets of glass to get into the school, and he did what he did. There was no officer there. If you look at uh, Uvalde, they just released the DOJ report a couple days ago. Um, that shooter was inside the school for a long time, and there was nobody there to do anything different to, to try to prevent or stop it. Um, if you look at the Covenant School from Nashville that happened last year, uh, law enforcement took, I think, seven or eight minutes to get there. Not their fault. It's their response time. There was nobody at the school, no SRO. And when they got there, they made entry. They didn't hesitate, and they put the shooter down, but not before the shooter had killed and wounded a lot of people. Um, I think that we're on borrowed time. In 2021, in May of 21, in Rigby, Idaho, it's the only school shooting that I can find in our record. Um, a female brought, a 12-year-old, brought a gun to school, shot and uh, wounded two students and the custodian on the school uh, grounds before she was wrestled down and they took the gun from her. That's our only school shooting in Idaho, and we are on borrowed time. And to think as we talk about the migration of all the people coming to, from other states to Idaho, our school populations are going up. Um, 
our staffing levels aren't. Law enforcement's not being given enough budgetary issues. They do the best that they can. They have SROs at some of the schools, but none of the elementary schools are really covered. Um, you get maybe 10 schools assigned to an SRO or five schools assigned to an SRO, and they try to bounce around and make their contacts. But we all know, that, as you said, the shootings are over quick. And when it takes two minutes to commit atrocities like this, where you're killing and wounding people, five minutes later when the deputy show up or the officer shows up, oftentimes it's over. And there's nothing that stops a bad guy with a gun quicker than a good guy with a gun. And these these cowards, when they come into these schools and they go after these kids and these teachers in a sheep's pen, it doesn't matter if the teachers or the kids beg for their lives. The shooter is there for maximum damage, maximum chaos, maximum casualty count. Um, so if there's something that we can do that's different, if we can get people that are prior law enforcement, prior military, prior, they've got hunting experience their whole lives, they've grown up around firearms, they're proficient with firearms, um, and they want to volunteer to be a first line of defense, force, mul force multiplier to back up law enforcement when they're not there. I mean, the other issue with SROs in schools and with departments, law enforcement, they have days off, they have training days, they have court days, they have vacation days, they call in sick. Oftentimes they don't backfill or they can't backfill. They don't have the budget to, to do it. So you don't have an SRO at the school. And what's the next best thing? Well, the next best thing is to call 911, God forbid something happens, and then you're waiting. And you're locking down the school, you're locking down classrooms, you're locking the front doors. These shooters, they're, they're shooting through glass to come in. You could have a metal detector at the front gate which is fine. That's that's another element of right. deterrence. But when somebody comes through that metal detector and they've got a, a weapon on them, then what? If there's not an SRO at the school, who deals with that intended shooter that has the weapon? It's the same scenario. You got to have somebody at the school. And uh, in, in no way, shape, or form is this any kind of a, a knock on law enforcement. It's the polar opposite. It's they're doing the absolute best they can they get to these things, they handle them the best they can all the time. Unfortunately, it's happening more and more. Um, but the, the knock is on the school districts that don't want to take that step. It's controversial. There's people that get scared. Oh, we're introducing guns into schools. The guns are going to jump out of people's pockets or their purses, and they're going to just start randomly shooting people. And it's kind of ironic because the same teachers that are teaching our kids, as you and I sit here right now, our kids are in schools. And those very same teachers who have custody of our kids as we sit here and speak, now if we introduce a firearm to that same teacher who we trust as we sit here now, now we think if we give them a gun and they're qualified to carry that gun and they want to volunteer to have a gun, that now somehow we can't trust them or we have to worry about their decision-making skills or we can't have it both ways. I mean, they have custody of our kids now. Why not give them another tool to protect them? Yeah, and, and those teachers are at risk too. Like Absolutely. The, the, the shooters, as horrible as this is, but like the shooters aren't coming to the school because they dislike the music teacher. I mean, maybe, who knows really what goes on, but they go to those schools and those places specifically because there are young people there. So the teachers are really, to some degree, being put at risk because they are educators, because they are in charge of you know these children. And- Man, it's it's really difficult. The it you have had experience with being, you know, the the boots on the ground, first line of defense in a in a school shooting. And and I again, I know this is a very difficult thing, but it, would you mind giving me information about like telling me what happened? Like was it was it that the police showed up, the good guys with guns that actually stopped the shooter? Like what what happened? From my experience, I mean, we, we went through active shooter training ad nauseum all the time. And we, we, where I came from in Southern California, we had Magic Mountain was a well-known amusement park. We used training there. We had victims that would pose or you know, they would get makeup put all over them and they would act as victims in the school or in the uh, amusement park. And we would do the same thing at schools. When schools were closed, in department stores, we would set up training all over the place. And... We trained so much that we would all talk like, gosh, we have another training day. Man, there's another training day. You got tired of it. And we never thought in a million years where we came from in suburbia, there was a town much like 
this valley here, lots of firemen, lots of cops, lots of military, lots of medical professionals. Um, and 7.30, 7.45 in that morning, I was at work and a call came out for shots fired. It was at a high school, Saugus High School, uh, November 14th of 2019. And the updates coming in was there's confirmed multiple gunshot victim down. Shots are still being fired. And I could not get there fast enough. Uh, my response time was about 12 minutes to get there from where I was. I was a field sergeant that day. And it continued. The calls, the updates were coming in. As I was pulling up to the school, literally hundreds of kids were running past me uh, out the school, down the street. I got kind of swallowed by kids as I was pulling in. And I ran into the school. Um, I didn't take the time to grab a shotgun or my AR-15. or I just went in with my pistol. And, uh, and when I ran the corner into the quad, I saw one of my friends who was off duty in civilian clothes. He had been dropping his kid off at the school when everything went down. Um, he's doing CPR on a kid. And there was a girl laying next to, to that boy that he was doing CPR on. There was a girl laying next to, to him. And he's yelling at me by name. You need to help me. we got to do CPR. You know, she's, she's not breathing. And I said, I can't stop, Danny. Where's the shooter? Where's the shooter? And he said, I think he went that way, but I need your help. I need your help. And I, in training, everything we do with active shooter training, as hard as it is, as terrible as it is, you have to bypass victims to go after the shooter. If you stop at a victim and that shooter's still out there, still claiming more victims, you're not doing any good. You got to put them down and stop it and then get all the help in to, to uh, render aid. That's just how it is. I mean, he's off duty. He's doing what he's doing, but as an on-duty person, personnel coming in we've got to go chase the shooter down and it was erroneous info typically when these things happen people get tunnel vision uh, they hear shots they see people running they see people running with cell phones in their hand they become the shooter um, you'll get people that are being described as the shooter that aren't the shooter and that's what happened in this incident um, as I looked down at her name was Gracie um, she was laying there obviously she was gone but um, I knew that she, we needed to do something for her, but I couldn't. And so I had to bypass her and press on. And we had another report. There was another gunshot victim down in a classroom on the north side of the school. So I took a couple deputies and we went up and got to, to that girl. And we got one fireman in to start rendering aid to her. She was shot in the stomach. And then uh, we had another report of another gunshot victim down in the um, administrative office. Somebody got to him. I didn't have to go to that. And then we got another report of another gunshot victim down in the choir room. And I had to take my team and get to the girl in the choir room. She was also shot in the stomach. Um, so it, it was pretty terrible, pretty chaotic. The shooter killed himself. We didn't have to engage him. Uh, he had killed himself right before we got there. We didn't know yet. Um, his We got him quickly identified as another student. And his cell phone was pinging to his house which was just north of the school up on top of a hill. So we assumed he got back to the school. I'm sorry, we assumed he got back to his house. We set up a containment on his house. Um, so now we got the issues at the school, evacuating kids, injured kids, people running everywhere, people locked down everywhere. And now we have another potential threat at the house. And the house was next door to an elementary school on top of the hill. So um, come to find out, He's not in the house. He left his phone at home on purpose. He had planned the whole thing out. He was dead on the campus. Um, pretty terrible thing. Uh, there was no SRO there when the shooting happened, when it started. However, there were a lot of off-duty personnel dropping their kids off. Uh, we had two L.A. County Sheriff personnel and a federal agent from the ATF that were immediately went into the school. They didn't hesitate. Off-duty, armed with nothing more than a handgun, no bulletproof vest, no helmet, no tactical gear. They went in. That's the her heroism of law enforcement. And we got there when we could, but it was like this terrible response time of hearing the updates, knowing it's legit, knowing it's not training. And then all that training came in. All the things that we would say, God, another day of training, it all came into play. Um, it was pretty tragic. And I still think about them, I think Gracie and, and Dominic. They were two of the kids that were killed. Um, it was ironic because Dominic's uncle was a deputy in our department. I didn't know that at the time. I found out afterwards. And 
I have kids in school. I had a son that was at high school, a neighboring high school when this happened. Um, I had my young daughter who was in third grade at the time. And so I called my wife from the campus and I said, get all, get our kids home. I want them out of the schools today. And schools were closed across the valley for a few days. And then I had to take my daughter to school that first day back. I took her on duty. I met my wife at the school and I posted up outside the school for a couple hours that day. I was so afraid of my, sounds crazy, but different school, but my third grader back in class, I was just picturing what I had just seen, trying to picture myself as one of those parents. Um, and somebody took a picture of me, dropped my kid off at school in my uniform and giving her a hug. And, and I saw that picture and I kind of lost it that day. I was like, man. And still when I, when I look at those pictures, it's, it's emotional. You know, you never forget it. And I think about all these officers and these deputies across this country that are dealing with this constantly. There's another shooting, there's another shooting, and whether it's Uvalde or Covenant or Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida, Parkland, or Sandy Hook or Iowa that just happened, these guys, or Saugus, these guys and girls that respond, they, we live with it for the rest of our lives. Not just us, but the firefighters, the paramedics, the nurses, the, the teachers. Teachers know these kids. Um, coaches and it's it's a terrible thing so what do you do when these things are happening do we get on that train of well we need to ban guns is that a reality no it's not a reality we need background checks we already have background checks people can lie on an application they can they can do whatever they're going to do red flag laws what does that mean you start looking at government overreach. We don't want to be told we can't have guns. And, and even if you take the guns away from the good people in our society, the bad guys are still going to get them. So we have an SRO program. All these different agencies have different variations of it. We had them, but our elementary schools didn't have them. And if you look at Sandy Hook and Uvalde and some of these other schools that are getting hit, they don't even have SROs. Um, so what do we do? We, we try to think of something outside the box and talking with Representative Hill um, guys that I worked with, my wife, my wife was a child abuse detective. I mean, she's, she's seen the worst of the worst in society with that stuff too. And she's all about protecting the kids. And so we kind of got a group of people together. What can we do different? And so we came up with this, well, how about finding some people in our schools, these teachers, these coaches that have experience, that have training, that would want to volunteer the thing that happened in Uvalde at Robb Elementary, um, one of the teachers, Eva Morellis, she was a cop's wife. Her husband was outside. She was in her classroom. She got shot, and she was asking them for help. Where are you guys? Why aren't you guys coming in? And it went on for a while, and she ended up dying. And I would forever, we can never change it, but I'd forever wonder, what if she had a gun? She's a cop's wife. She probably has grown up around gun shooting with him. Our wives all shoot with us. Um, would she have been the perfect you know, person to have one? We'll never know, but can we not do something to not make her death in vain? Can we give the capability to another teacher in another school where the shooting hasn't happened yet? Sadly, we know it's going to happen. As you and I sit here right now, it's going to happen at some point, somewhere in this country. Is Idaho next? I don't know. Um, but why not? give our teachers a chance. And if one teacher or two teachers or five at a school say, absolutely, I shoot all the time. I used to be a cop. I was in the military deployed or whatever, um, or I hunt or whatever it is. And there's a program that, that the school can get on board with to get these people armed, voluntary, not require them to take action, but God forbid it happens, they can if they need to. Um, anybody that thinks that a teacher or a student, run, hide, fight is a great thing. The LA County Sheriff's Department taught run, hide, fight. It's gone nationwide. It's a, it's a legitimate thing. If you think about running first, hiding if you can't get far, and fighting if it comes down to it. They teach it even in business now, unfortunately, because these mass shootings are becoming so common. But if you do something different, and you, will, you think that you're going to hide behind a desk or behind a chair or in a closet and that that shooter, when he or she finds you, is going to say, all right, I won't shoot you. All right, you're pleading for your life. I'll let you go. I'll let you live. And you think that's going to work. It is not going to work. They're going to shoot you every time. They are there to kill. They are there to destroy. 
they're out of their minds. It takes a certain person, a certain animal to do that to a kid in the first place. You can't negotiate with it. That principal in Iowa just tried to. The guy shot him three times, killed him. So if the SRO can't be there, if their response time is on average two minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, and this thing's over so fast, what can we do different? The answer that we came up with is coming up with a program for people to volunteer for an arm. Um, I was in another school shooting, but it ended quicker. There was only one injury. Um, while we were responding to it, the guy, the kid brought an AK-47 to school. It was a collapsible one, came out of a duffel bag, took it in the bathroom at Highland High School in Palmdale, California, fired a couple rounds in the ceiling, and then came out, fired one round across the quad, fragment, hit a kid in the leg, put him down. The kid got scared that had the gun. He ran with it, dropped it, and fled the school. He didn't do any other damage. But we had to treat it the same way. While we were responding to that, Probably somebody listening to a scanner thought it'd be funny. They called in another active shooter at a different school, elementary school. Um, my team got sent to the bogus call, but we had to treat it the right way. And I remember at the time, again, my daughter was very young, and it was in a short period before the Saga shooting happened. And we were clearing hallways, and we were finding little kids hiding under desks that were five years old, little kids fi you know, hiding in closets, um, seeing the fear in their face, and it was a bogus call. I can't even imagine these kids in these schools now that are that are doing the same thing, trying to hide and, and survive, and they're getting murdered. You know, and, and it, it really hit home for me. And I just think we got to do something different. And Representative Hill agrees, and several other legislators agree. So, man, that uh, yeah, the. The reliance on what we all agree is the correct response, which is police officers, right? We need law enforcement Absolutely. There. No one calls for anything other than a police officer in when something like this happens, when there's an active shooter. So we all universally agree that police officers are the right response. And we're agreeing they're the right response, not because they're going to negotiate not because they're going to uh, you know plead or do anything they're the right response because they have force capable of stopping the person and they're trained and they know how to do it the next layer is hey an sro is great right like you can't get the police there fast enough that's the nature of sros we have school resource officers they they're they're people there that are trained not they don't have the same you know arsenal they don't have the same manpower they but they're there right they're the response is there. Why do we rely on them? Same thing. They're not there to negotiate. They're not there to like ask nicely. They're there with some capacity of force to put the person down, to stop it, right? Because you need the force to stop it. There's a disconnect that happens when you go from overwhelming police force, right? That takes time, more immediate, potentially police force uh, from the SRO down to a teacher who is trained or deputized or has gone through whatever service and training required, there's a disconnect because all of a sudden that person is a danger to children and the system for some reason. And and I've heard a lot of objections to this, like they could drop the firearm, they could they could not identify themselves. They could, you know, uh, they wouldn't be competent in the event that something happened. And I don't understand what that disconnect is, which is like, we know that people properly trained with the capacity for force are the right response. But for some reason, if it's like, I, I think everybody envisions the like 55 year old English teacher who's just, you know, doesn't want to be responsible for the protection of the students. And by the way, first off, I think a lot of 55 year old English teachers would put the kids behind them. I don't think the 55 year old English teacher would be like, oh no, I'm more important than these kids. Like that, I'm confident that the people I've met would be like, get behind me. Even if I have nothing to defend us, like stand behind me. They love their kids. Right. They do. Mm -hmm. And again, I, what do you think that is? Like what, what is inherent in the concern and the, the it's like the break of logic where it's like, look, you believe in trained uh, capable of force individuals, just not if they happen to teach math, 
right? Like they have to solely be working for the police department as if there's some magic thing about about that. Yeah, that's a better option, but is it a better option compared to no option? Yeah, I, I think that we just have to reprogram ourselves. It's a sad thing, but we do. If we look at how we live our daily lives, we have car insurance, we have homeowner's insurance, we have fire insurance, we got insurance for everything, for health insurance, we got it all. Why don't we have insurance for our kids? This is an insurance policy, just like all these other insurances we have. We never want to have to use it. We hope we never use it. We just spend the, the money that we have to pay for our insurance every day, and we hope we never get in that crash. We hope our house doesn't burn down. We hope we don't get a flood, but we have it just in the event it does. Right. And if it does, we're going to call the plumber. We're going to call the fire department. We're going to call whoever to come help us. This is an insurance policy for our kids. If we're willing to do it for them, for, for all these other things, why can't we do it for them? And I think that the issue with the fear factor, I kind of touched on it earlier, but we trust our teachers right now to have our kids. As we sit here, they have our kids. Introducing a gun doesn't change that same person that you trust. It now just gives them another tool to make sure our kids can come home to us. And... You know, how it gets lost in the shuffle and, the, and these pictures that they want to paint of these one-armed, half-blind, deaf people pushing a walker, wielding a gun around. Um, that is just that knee-jerk reaction of change that people don't like. And it's drastic change, but it's drastic change we have to do. I, I haven't heard. I've asked. I've put it out on social media, on our website, on our Facebook page. Give us some ideas. Tell us something. Give us something. The one that I keep hearing is a metal detector, and I touched on that earlier too. Metal detector, fine. We don't want to turn our kids, our schools into prisons either. We don't want them looking like they're in a compound with barbed wire and and you know guard towers and guards at the gate. And that's not the school that we want to have. Right, and the nuance with the metal detector, it's it's again, you have rules like you can't bring a gun in here, okay? But the rules are meaningless unless you have the capacity to enforce them. So to your point. Like, yeah, you can set up a metal detector, but somebody hellbent on a mass shooting, like if they go through the metal detector and there's a collapsible AK-47, who's going to enforce like, no, 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 you can't bring that in there. Like, so now you have to actually have some capacity for force at the metal detectors for the metal detectors to mean anything in the event you're dealing with a crazy person. Absolutely. I mean, they work if, if you got a kid, you know at a school inner city and you got gang problems and things like that. And people are trying to carry a gun while they're in school just in case something happens to them. Sure. That's what the metal detector is going to stop. It's not going to stop the mass shooter. The mass right. shooter is going to get in. The mass shooter is going to fire through the glass to come in. They're going to do whatever they got to do to get in the school. Rob elementary was an unlocked door. He got in the side through an unlocked door. Um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas high school. The kid was a student, Iowa. The kid was a student, um, Sandy Hook, he shot his way through. Oxford shot his way through. Saugus High School, he was a student, snuck it on campus. Um, but the other thing with, and if you look at all these shootings, um, I gave you a, a, a write-up that you can look at, but there's shootings that I singled out. I'd say 90% of these shooters, 95, they're either on a suicide mission or they shoot it out and it's a suicide by cop mission. Um, it's not that often that when these people commit these shootings that they have any intention whatsoever of getting away. And that's the bigger fear. If you look at it, if we're talking about arming a, a teacher to protect their classroom or protect their school, what is there anything better that we can do besides that? I don't see any other avenue. If you have a, a shooter that's coming to a school with full intention of dying that day themselves, and they've made that commitment. They're going to kill themselves or they're going to get killed. What does that tell you? What is the mentality that you're dealing with? You have to do something to put them down and stop them. Um, and the, the cops cannot be there 24-7. They just can't be. It's just not a reality. Um, when they are there, they're outstanding. And when they're responding there and they get there, they're outstanding. But they can't always be there. Right. And... And look, how many mass shootings have been attempted on police departments? Rarely. If right. Ever. Maybe Seattle when Seattle fell. I don't know. They attacked a police station. but Right. And that's more of 
I don't. When you say they, that's more of like a mob thing. Yeah. Right. Like the history is filled with mobs tearing down. You know, government to protect whatever. Right. But no, the individuals are not going to somewhere that's well defended, or they know that there's a high likelihood of defense. In this situation, it, they're specifically selecting schools because obviously they're crazy and deranged, but also because the schools are not defended. If you knew that you're walking into a school with armed, I think we should stop calling them teachers because it should more be like deputies that also teach, <laughs> right? Like I think that's different because I think if you just say teacher psychologically, it doesn't encompass everything that we're talking about. But if you had deputies, deputized officers that also taught subjects on campus, just saying it that way, you're like, oh, I'm not going there. Like, yeah. that's crazy. But what if you had six of them? What if you had 10 of them? What if you had an unknown number? You talk about an insurance policy, and yes, insurance in the event that the absolute worst should happen. But we all have blind spot detectors, right? We all have rear view mirrors. We all have all, all kinds of things on our new vehicles because the insurance companies realized it would be far better to actually prevent people from doing these things, however you're going to do it, than to actually use the insurance, right? And so car manufacturers make these, your insurance policies are lower, all kinds of things. If you had an armed campus with deputized officers that also taught subjects, the deterrent factor for someone going in there would be so substantial. And yeah, we're talking about crazy people. So like maybe we can't 100% understand what the crazy people would be thinking, but we can agree that the crazy people by and large are motivated by delivering the most malicious, horrific event they can possibly muster in a short time frame before their five or 10 minutes of insanity is up, right? Okay, well, if that's true and you're hell-bent on delivering the absolute worst, you're going to go where you can deliver the absolute worst, right? And if you know that you will uh, uh, engage some meaningful defense or obstruction, it's like, shoot, well, I'm not going to be able to make the comment on, on the world. I'm not going to be able to make people suffer in the same way that I thought. I can't imagine I can't imagine, especially somebody hellbent on destruction, would go somewhere where they knew there were people there that could stop them. Yeah, and that's one of the bigger things about these schools in Idaho, too, is you have schools that have gun-free zone signs posted up around the schools. That's like an advertisement. And it's one of the things that Representative Hill put in the bill was to remove those signs. And if those signs aren't removed, then the school's going to get fined every day that the sign's up there. I think that inviting it, saying, hey, we're, we have no guns here, come on in, is to your point. It's making it a softer target. We need to harden these schools. We need to send that message out. We need to say, hey, you want to risk coming in the school? Yeah, you may have come here today with no intention of walking out, but you're definitely not going to get very far into the school. Right. And there's a there's also a large line of thought. I uh, spoke with um, uh, Deputy Gomez about this on, on one of our last conversations. And he was talking about, uh, I think it was actually after we're kind of we're going to revisit it because we have he has a, a wealth of knowledge, uh, multiple uh, multiple areas uh, having to do with school safety. One of them he was saying though he he actually had gone to a convention where they were talking about best strategies for an active shooter on campus, and he's he's a big proponent of locking locking schools down. And there was an individual who was actually presenting at the same convention that said you like the lockdown. He said yeah, absolutely. Like lock them down, make them as tight as possible. And this individual was like I'm actually against them. I would love for you to come and hear what I say. And his position was plain as day. He says, "Look, the lockdowns don't actually work." Okay? Statistically. He says because look, every 10 seconds that goes by someone else dies. Okay, so if you have officers that arrive at a lockdown school, it could be a matter of minutes before they even gain access to the school. Matter of minutes, every 10 seconds, statistically, someone's dying, right? It also makes it very laborious to actually find the active shooter, right? And he goes through all these things. I'm not going to you know, do it just by presenting it, but Officer Gomez says it really made him stop and think about, okay, what are the best strategies here? Because the idea that like we need to turtle shell harder and harder and harder it's disingenuous because you have kids that go out at recess, right? Like right. even if you make a bomb shelter where people football learn practice. English, right? Football mm -hmm. practice, recess, any, any elementary school mm -hmm. has like two or three recesses every single day where the doors are open, people are moving in and out. Mm -hmm. There's zero capacity to, to protect the children. 
that's that's uh, like that's exactly what it is, right? Like you're not gonna you're not gonna prevent somebody from even if you have a, a fence around it. Like, what do you think somebody's gonna stop at a fence? Like, if they're hell bent on doing these things, a physical yeah. obstruction like a chain link fence is gonna stop them. And then what? We're we're gonna surround our school, schools with like concertina wire and no, uh, that like we're not gonna do that either. So at some point, people have to make a decision between I want to try, right? Which is what people say when they know what they're doing is ineffective. We have to try, right? You see this with a homeless crisis in California. People know the money they're throwing after it is not doing anything. Drug problems, it's not doing anything. But the mantra is we have to try. So they continue trying to stricter gun laws, right? Uh, gun show regulations, um, you know, making things more and more illegal, uh, doing more and more training. It's like, listen, that's trying. How well is that working? It's not working. So I think at the end of the day, it appears to me, and I'm an idiot, so whatever, <laughs> but it appears to me that people either are going to make the decision that we have to keep trying and harping about gun control, which is not going to get very far in this state, harping about gun control, harping around background checks, harping about making gun-free zones, even though these are crazy people that don't care about the law, right? Or except that what has been attempted is not successful, right? And maybe step outside and uh, think outside the box. You know, again, deputies that also teach math. That sounds a lot better than, than an armed teacher. But if you had people that were under the umbrella of a sheriff's department or a police department and thoroughly trained to the confidence of those departments and offices, why wouldn't you want that person on campus? Yeah, I agree. And... And what I touched on before, I mean, we have a friend that's out here that's a fourth grade school teacher, and she was a cop in L.A., and this is her second line of work. She carry a gun in a heartbeat, and I think you're going to find a lot of people like that, too. Um, if the, the biggest issue that we've heard or that I've seen, too, is budgetary. If it involves more money, if it involves having to raise taxes to pay for stuff, they're not going to do it. And... Even if it's to the detriment of our kids, they're just not going to come up with the money to fund it. So that's where you start trying to, okay, well, how do we negotiate that then? And if it's if that's a roadblock, what do we do to get past it? That's where we go back to the voluntary aspect. And of the teachers, the faculty, I, I'll call it faculty instead of teachers because, you know, your librarian, your football coach, your weight training coach, your strength and conditioning coaches, or your custodians, um, they all have all kinds of experiences that, that aren't just specific to, to teaching. Um, a lot of them have military. There's a ton of military in our schools, a right. ton of experience, and they're trained. They've carried guns for years and know how to probably take them apart, put them back together in their sleep. Um, why can't we tap into that as a resource? Why can't we adapt and come up with something different? Um, one of the other things I wanted to touch on real quick is when the Boise Town Square Mall shoot, shooting happened, that was one of those chaotic ones like our, our school one that I, I rolled to. When these shootings happen, people get tunnel vision. They get the adrenaline pump. They get tunnel vision. They hear really good. They can hear everything, but your vision gets really tiny. And when shots are being fired and people are going down, you see things differently. And when people are running with stuff you think they're a shooter the boise town square mall shooting they got reports of multiple shooters um they they did get i think there were six people shot a couple were killed in it the guy engaged boise pd outside in a shootout thankfully the, the officer was okay that that the round came through the windshield um but the point of why i'm bringing it up is the whole valley of law enforcement rolled to that everybody responded everybody they thought there was multiple shooters, gunshot victims down, it's chaos, it's a mall. And what did that cause? There was nobody protecting our schools. If if it was the, the stars aligned that day and evil was abound and, a, and somebody went to a school that day out here in, in this valley, whether it was Star, Eagle, Middleton, Meridian, wherever, pick one, um, who's protecting it? And how long would it have taken, God forbid, that day that that animal went into a school and decided this is the day I'm going to do it? How long would it have taken to get law enforcement to that school, pick one, because everybody was in Boise at that town square mall? And if you would have got one, how many officers would have you got or deputies? One, two, 
waiting for more people to show up. They're going to go in and handle business, but that is the the environment that unfortunately we live in. We live in a sick world. Idaho is not immune, and I just hope and pray that that uh, people that are naysaying about it, that are pushing back and saying, "No, we can't give guns to our teachers," and we're they're, they're there to teach. The narrow mindedness of that is going to be directly responsible for more chaos and why can't we do something to protect them? We all say that we want to protect our kids and our, our faculty. This is a way to do it. There is a way to do something. This is a tangible way to do something. It's not just empty words. It's not talk. It's not all try. It's something. And all of the other things for the last 30 years, 40 years, haven't worked. So do we keep doing the same thing in the hamster wheel, keep running and, and, and getting nowhere? until the next one, and then the same talking points happen again? Or do we actually step out and actually do something that's going to be productive and, and albeit controversial, um, we'll maybe never know how successful it was. Maybe, like you said, somebody see, uh, you know what, I ain't doing it. I'll, I'll go to, to, sadly, I'll go to the shopping center. I'll go to Walmart and do it, or the mall, or church. Churches are arming up. There's a lot of churches with armed right. personnel now. Why is that? They're hardening the churches as targets. You have armed personnel at these churches. There's kids in the churches. Are those kids in danger now because they've got armed personnel protecting them so that they can worship and, and pray? No, they're safer. We need to start looking at our schools the same way. Right. I have uh, I have family members who actually um, you know carry when they go to church, and they're responsible, and it's no problem. But it would be curious to find out what they think when their kids go off to school. It's like you go to your place of worship and you have the capacity to protect yourself and your family. And then your kids go off to school with nothing there, right? Like how is this really different? Um, and again, of course, I know there are differences, but you know, the, the reliance Idaho is very proud in in my in my experience, very independent state, and people take care of their business, you know, and the reliance on other large responding bodies is just not in a, in a multitude of areas, not just law enforcement. It's like people take care of themselves, and they take care of their neighbors, and they they care for each other. Um, and I hope they figure out some way to do that with this too. No, I do Rob, too. Listen, thank you for coming. I appreciate you sharing your experience and uh, and talking talking through these. These are really dark issues, and it's not like I have three little kids. It's not stuff that I even like hearing and talking about, but the alternative is that I know there's a problem, and I just reject the capacity to even explore it, which is which is not helping my, my kids at school. So again, thank you for coming, and I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it too. This podcast is brought to you by MTU Studios. If you're looking to start a podcast or need content for your business or personal use, content of any type, please reach out to MTU Studios. MTUstudios.com, we'd love to help.